Well, thank you for having me, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with um, a group of uh, amazing minds and uh, people that are making a difference in a lot of lives. And ours is certainly uh, one of those. Our family has a story of whole genome sequencing success. And um, in order to, to tell this story, I want to kind of take you on a journey, if you don't mind. I want to go back to 1996. Uh, my husband and I have three kids. Uh, our oldest son is Zach. He is standing in front of our tw fraternal twins, Noah and Alexis. They were born on August 16, 1996 came into this world in a normal delivery. We went home two days later, and our lives were changed completely forever. Uh, Noah and Alexis were colicky for 15 months. They cried nonstop through the day and at night. They also had uh, a lot of internal issues going on. Noah and Alexis were both throwing up massive amounts every day, multiple times a day. They weren't reaching any of their <coughs> developmental milestones. They were floppy. They were so floppy that at, at age nine months, uh, when you would hold them, you actually had to support their backs or they would flop back. So at their nine-month well check, I took them to their pediatrician, and at that point, she was concerned. Um, she sent us to an early intervention program where they uh, evaluated Noah and Alexis, and they deemed them developmentally delayed. So they put them on a list for therapies, which would include speech therapy, physical therapy, <coughs> occupational therapy, and uh, early intervention therapy. She then sent us to a pediatric gastroenterologist that did upper GIs on Noah and Alexis, and it came back showing nothing of significance. We were then sent to a pediatric neurologist and at a year of age, he started with the metabolic tests. And uh, Noah and Alexis have this unique, they have a lot of unique things in them. And one of the unique things with Noah and Alexis is their veins. They tend to shut down when they're having blood drawn. So they would go back and forth. Um, they wouldn't get the eight vials of blood that they needed. Um, so I would have to take them back. So they were stuck over 100 times for this one test um, at less than a year of age. Uh, to find out that they did not have a metabolic disorder. Uh, at, a, at one year of age, we took Alexis uh, to have an MRI done. So they put Alexis under. They did an MRI, uh, found nothing of significance. And I'm kind of taking you through this journey because I know that a lot of you in this room are scientists and you do research and you um, write papers and, and a lot of it's centered around patients and you're making huge advances and but sometimes you can um, I, I believe you can get maybe a little disconnected that the 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 good stuff that you're working on um, the advances that you're making these are these are patients like uh, my three kids and um, I'm sure a lot of you have children and maybe they've been through health problems maybe a parent or a family member uh, so we were thrown into this world that we were not prepared for. Uh, so we started down this journey of specialists and tests and hospital visits. And this is a snapshot. This is not all-inclusive, but on the left-hand side of this slide are some of the tests, most of the tests, most of the doctors that we took Noah and Alexis to in the first five and a half years of their lives. Um, they were, ha they had a whole array of issues. Alexis had urine that would reflux up into her kidneys. Uh, she would have urinary tract infections from this. Her temperatures, one time I had her at an urgent care and her temperature spiked up to 107.5. Um, so they called an ambulance, took us to the emergency room. She had seizures. Uh, Noah had uh, continued to throw up. Uh, massive amounts every day. So he was going to a gastroenterologist. So all of the tests on the left-hand side, all of the doctors, all of the specialists, and the results of all of those things are on the right-hand side of the slide. And in 1998, we had an MRI done on Noah, which showed brain damage in the ventricle area of his brain. So this was called PVL for periventricular leukomalacia. Um, that's why we call it PVL. And um, this was a textbook case of cerebral palsy. 
I had done research from the time they were nine months old and we knew there were problems and this fit everything that I read. They diagnosed Alexis under the assumption that she had lost oxygen while in the womb, um, that they both did. It made sense. Uh, and so what we did is we had this diagnosis that we would find out later was incorrect and we built all of their therapies, all of their treatments around an incorrect diagnosis. So as you can imagine, there was a great cost that was continuing to mount in our family. There was not only a financial cost that we were um, undergoing, but there was also an emotional and a physical cost that was extreme, um, not just for our uh, immediate family, but for our extended family and our friends. This is a snapshot of Noah and Alexis between age four and five. You can see Alexis's eyes would roll up into her head. Um, her forearms were up to her chest. Her hands would point down. Her body would tremor for hours at a time. And there, were, there was a good part of the day, by age five and a half certainly, that you could not reach her for hours at a time. Um, by 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning, she could no longer sit up. She could no longer walk, certainly could no longer walk. She couldn't swallow food. Um, and then Noah's presentation was completely different from Alexis's. He had issues, he continued to have internal issues with throwing up. Um, he drooled a massive amount, um, slurred, and had a little bit of lagging with his walk. In 2002, I had, uh, I was doing research and I came across this article that spoke of another disorder that mimics cerebral palsy. So it was titled Deaf Diagnosis, Sagawa's Dystonia Mimics Cerebral Palsy, but it's treatable. So when I read this article, um, one of the common threads that separates this disorder from CP is how the patients function at a higher level in the morning and as the day goes on they become more debilitated. And that was Alexis. And so as soon as I read the article, I knew this is what she had. My husband got home that night. I showed him the article. He agreed. That night, we shot an email to Dr. John Fink out of the University of Michigan. Midnight on a Thursday night, Friday morning, Dr. Fink responded to the email, 6 a.m. And in the header, I put our daughter shows signs of Sagawa's dystonia. He responded, asked questions. The next email I sent out, I said, you know, the idea that our daughter has something that is treatable is truly beyond anything we could have imagined. Is there any way that we could see you? Well, he was book solid for six months. We went back and forth with emails, questions, answers, and uh, about five more emails into it, he had just received two cancellations for the following week. So we're in his office on Wednesday, April 10th, 2002. Dr. Fink walks into the office. First thing he asks, where did you find the article? I told him it was in the midst of my current research material. It was an 11-year-old article written in the Los Angeles Times. Um, so we, we knew we were guided here on this journey. And um, Dr. F uh, Fink took a look at Noah. He took a look at all of his scans. I brought everything with us, all the MRIs, all the tests. And he didn't see the dystonia in Noah at the time. We didn't see the dystonia in Noah at the time. Um, he looked at Alexis. He looked at all of her tests. He watched her gait. He checked her muscle tone. He definitely thought there could be something there. So he asked us to bring her back to clinic that night. And he said, do not let her take a nap. Well, Alexis needed a nap every day of her life. Um, that was kind of what restored her ability to function. So we left his office. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning. We went to a restaurant, and we had to pick her up out of the car, and we had to carry her into the restaurant, and we put her down on a chair, and we held her up, because otherwise she would have fallen off the chair at age five and a half. So Joe brought over some food, and we put the straw to her mouth. She couldn't swallow. And so, as you can imagine, the rest of the day was filled with um, a lot of challenges. Uh, Lexus was uh, crying. She couldn't function. We had to carry her. We went back to clinic that night to see Dr. Fink, and he looked at her. 
went over a lot of information with, uh, about matters of the brain, the basal ganglia, the separation, the differences between dystonia and cerebral palsy. And he gave us a prescription for the drug L-DOPA. He told us to give her a quarter of a pill that night, a quarter of a pill in the morning and at lunch and the next day, and then we would make contact again. So we gave her a quarter of this tiny little pill, 10 100 milligrams of the Carbidopa Levodopa. And at age five and a half, Alexa slept for the first time in her life. She had a sleeping disorder, so she never slept through the night. So we didn't know what that meant. The next morning, she woke up full of energy. We gave her another quarter of this little pill. And she walked to our rental car. And for the first time in her life, she got into a car on her own. And she pulled the seatbelt down on her own for the first time in her life at age five and a half. So my husband and I were in the front seat, tears in our eyes. We knew we were witnessing a miracle. And the rest of the day was, the, was exactly like that. We went to lunch that day. Um, she sat in a restaurant on a chair and ate lunch. If you walked by her and you saw her, you would think she's just a five-year-old girl. Whereas the day before, you would have walked by her and thought, there's a little girl with a lot of problems. Um, that afternoon, the boys were exhausted, so we took them back to the hotel. Uh, they needed a nap, and um, I took Alexis down to a little play area and rented a paddle boat. We went paddle boating on the water. Uh, we, I took her to this little play structure, structure where she was running up the play structure and sliding down the slide, and running back up the play structure and sliding down the slide. And at one point, I remember she uh, nicked, she must have nicked her lip. And when she got to the top of the slide, there was this little boy sitting on the top of the slide, and, and he wasn't going down, and she was behind him, and she was, you know, just looking at him, and, and he said, is, is that blood or is that lipstick? And, and she looked at him, and she said, you know, it's blood. Okay, let's go, let's go. And she was so impatient. And I, I thought that moment was so profound. Because I, I was thinking, you know, she has this newfound ability. She has this body that is functioning, and she doesn't know how long it's going to last. She doesn't know if it's going to go away from her in the next five or ten minutes. So she wants to make as much use of this opportunity as she can. And I thought in that moment, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we were all like that? Didn't want to waste a second of the life that we've been given and use it to the fullest ability that we can. So we came home uh, a couple months later, Noah's onset started. Um, his foot started turning in, his head started going down, he started drooling. His feet started crossing center. We took him to several neurologists. Nobody would start him on the medication because it's known to cause stomach problems and he already was throwing up massive amounts every day. So we took him back to Dr. Fink and um, said, we have Alexis's medication, so we can do it on our own, or, but we really want you to be a part of it. He acquiesced to a month trial period for Noah, and after six years of throwing up every day of his life, Noah stopped throwing up. And after 10 days, uh, his feet went back to normal. It's a progressive disorder. It gets worse until it robs you of your ability to function. So we had these new kids. We had this new life. Alexis was in dance. Um, they were playing basketball together. They played soccer together. They uh, played every sport that you could think of. Dr. Fink told us their body's like plastic. We have to kind of restructure it and get them involved in everything that we can. They, they did karate. Um, and so we had this new incredible life. So fast forward from, from this period, and we go up to year 2008. So in 2008, my husband uh, received a phone call from a headhunter at a life science company. It was, the name of the company was Invitrogen, and uh, they were getting ready to acquire Applied Bio. Well, Joe was, had been the CIO at America West Airlines when they acquired U.S. Airways, and that was the largest merging of systems at the time. And so they were very interested in acquiring his skills. And I, I, you know, he told me about it. And we always had calls from headhunters. And I just thought, you know, 
California, raising our kids in California, preconceived notions. And so we decided to go out to San Diego, and we had dinner with Greg Lucier and his wife, Marilena. And I shared the story of Noah and Alexis. And at that point, it was a success story. And Greg told us that the company they were getting ready to acquire, Applied Bio, was making equipment that would one day be able to diagnose kids like Noah and Alexis at birth. Well, I had started a website in 2003, a year after we found their diagnosis, and we had been able to reach people around the world that had been misdiagnosed, that had been in wheelchairs, um, that responded to the medication, that went from unable to uh, go to the bathroom on their uh, own, unable to scratch their own face, to playing tennis on their high school tennis teams, um, taking care of the 38-year-old woman in a wheelchair her whole life, um, contacted me after reading an article, and she's able to function and do things she could never do before. And throughout all these years, it was always when people would reach me, how do I find out if my child has this? How do I find out if I have this? And it was always a response to the medication. So we were so on board, a diagnostic tool that would be able to diagnose kids like Noah and Alexis at birth. So we moved out to San Diego in 2008, and a year later in 2009, Alexis had a chronic cough that she had been dealing with for years. The doctors kept thinking it was uh, allergies, maybe it was reflux. We tried different medications, different therapies. Nothing would work. So, all of a sudden, this chronic cough turned into a severe breathing problem. And um, we were in this world again of uh, emergency room visits. We had paramedics in our house on two occasions. And this severe breathing problem was literally life-threatening. Uh, we had paramedics in our house when she was turning blue trying to get her to breathe again. We had seven emergency room visits in two months. We were back into the world of doctors and specialists and unknowns, and nobody could help figure out what was going on. So this is a snapshot, again, of most of the doctor's visits, of most of the appointments, of most of the procedures that Alexis underwent in a period of 18 months. And the results from all of these tests and all of these doctor's visits were no answers. And again, we had a cost that was involved, and there was a high financial cost, but more than that, there was a physical cost and an emotional cost that continued to mount because we, our daughter at this time, was 13, 14 years old, we had a baby monitor in her room because we didn't know if she would make it through the night. We literally didn't know if she would make it through the night every night. She was inhaling racemic epinephrine through a nebulizer just to stay alive. If you are familiar at all with racemic epinephrine, you can only get it at the hospital or at hospital pharmacies. They use it um, in severe cases to help patients breathe. And she was inhaling it every day just to stay alive. So we're in this um, world again of chaos and no answers. And Joe and I went to a biocom conference where I heard Dr. Eric Topol speaking. And he was speaking about uh, whole genome sequencing and the advances that had been made. And, um, and as he spoke and he showed the slides of the mutations that had been discovered over the past few years and the advancements that have been made, a thought start, started to occur to me. What if we had Alexis, her whole genome sequenced? So I asked my husband, is there any way that we can pay to have Alexis's whole genome sequenced? Um, he gave me the name of a guy at uh, his company, Life Technologies. I sent an email, introduced myself. He got together with Jim Lepsky and Richard Gibbs and uh, Matthew Bainbridge and the team at uh, the Human Genome Center and Baylor College of Medicine, and they decided to engage in a project 
to sequence the Beery twins and see if they could find a genetic mutation responsible for their neurologic disorder. And that was the goal for everybody on the team. Um, but my goal was to find something that would help my daughter breathe and something that would sustain her life. And so we engaged in this project uh, with the team at Baylor. We flew out to Houston. We got to meet everyone. It was uh, a, quite an experience because I think a lot of the scientists, a lot of the researchers that were working on their DNA at the time, actually when we were there, we're, we're right in the middle of the solid systems that sequenced NOAA and Alexis, the very equipment that Greg Lucier was telling us about from Applied Bio. Uh, we actually got to see their blood in the sequencer. We got to see the reagents. We got to see the whole process. How cool is that? And then we got to go to the computer screens of uh, some of the researchers that were actually looking at the data from their DNA. And we drew their blood in August. And in, two, uh, in November, three months later, we got a call from the team saying that they had found something. So we flew back out to Houston. We meet with... Uh, Jim Lovsky, Richard Gibbs, Matthew Bainbridge, a whole slew of people in a room that wanted to be there for the presentation. Uh, Wojek Wisniewski, sorry. Uh, and they showed us the findings. And so they showed us the slides. Actually, Wojek led the, the whole uh, um, slide presentation. And he was showing us the slides where they had found the genetic mutation in myself, a genetic mutation in Joe. And together, Noah and Alexis got both hits um, or copies of this mutation um, in the Sepatarium reductase gene. So that showed us that not only were their dopamine levels low, but their serotonin levels were low as well. And I remember there were mixed conversations going on. My husband and Richard were having conversations about, you know, this is like the first black and white evidence that we have. This is, you know, amazing. Um, and I was thinking, this is going to solve Alexis's breathing problem. So we took all this information back to their new neurologist in San Diego, and um, she was very familiar with this particular mutation. She's actually written several papers on it. Um, we had just moved to her right before we engaged in this project. And so she knew exactly how to dose the, the medication. This is, we had several options with serotonin. You know, serotonin is associated with emotion and anxiety and um, depression. And there's three ways that we could have uh, administered, we could have administered three different kinds of drugs. And so we decided to uh, use an amino acid that would increase Alexis's serotonin levels. So we added 5-HTP, something you can get over the counter. Uh, we were having it compounded to bring it on in a slow uh, way. And within 10 days of starting on the 5-HTP, Alexis no longer needed daily breathing treatments of racemic epinephrine. And within three weeks, she was back to running track. So we had to pull her out of all sports for 18 months because she couldn't breathe. So whole genome sequencing. On the left-hand side, you can see how much we endured with whole genome sequencing. And this is all-inclusive on this slide. So we had to fill out consent forms, and we had blood draws. And I'll never forget when we had the kids' blood drawn Noah said, that's it, that's it, a blood draw, that's it. Because these kids had been through so many invasive tests and put under so many times for other tests, he couldn't, he couldn't take it in that you could sequence a whole genome through a blood draw. So we gathered information, um, history, family histories, and uh, we gave it all to uh, the team, and the results on the right-hand side, we got a definitive, complete diagnosis for Noah and Alexis for the first time ever. We got something that was black and white that told us exactly what we were dealing with. And not only did we get something that told us what we were dealing with, 
but there was also a treatment that was available to complete to complete their full treatment. The results for Alexis were um, the ability to breathe again, the ability to run again, the ability to live her life to the fullest and do all those things that she loves to do. The results for Noah were very interesting uh, because of how we associate uh, serotonin with emotion and anxiety. Uh, what came from Noah was, uh, was very interesting. You don't really know how the neurotransmitters work in the pathway. So we saw improvement in his fine motor skills. Uh, his writing improved. Um, his ping pong game improved. He was beating Alexis at ping pong. So she was not happy with that particular result. Um, but so be it. So we had new life for our family. A whole genome sequencing literally gave us our daughter back. Um, this is a slide of Alexis in 2002. That's very easy, sorry. I just realized I was supposed to put this down. Let's see if I can find it again. Okay. This is Alexis after whole genome sequencing. family today. We're healthy, we're happy, um, we're able to do things that we never thought were possible. Um, we've been blessed. But this picture of our family doesn't represent a lot of the families that I work with. I work with families that have children that are losing abilities every day. I work with families that have pictures with wheelchairs in them, that have feeding tubes in them, that have missing people in their pictures because they didn't make it to diagnosis. I've gone to a funeral of a four-year-old and a six-year-old who died undiagnosed. And I don't want to do that anymore. The work that you're doing is significant. The work that you're doing is saving lives. The work that you're doing is changing um, outcomes. And it's important. And if you ever um, start to uh, look at the paper and think of it as just a paper or find yourself disconnected to the paper, if you don't get to see the patient in person, then I want you to think about Alexis and her picture. I want you to think about Alexis before, and I want you to think about Alexis after. And I want you to put her face with the data that you're working on. And I want you to put her face with the analysis that you're doing. And I want you to know that what you're working on, that child or that adult or who, whatever the patient looks like, that is a person that wants to live their life to the fullest. And you are making a difference. And so we appreciate everything that you've done. And we are so grateful. And I want to say on behalf of our family and all the other families that I work with and all the other families out there that are struggling to find diagnosis, keep moving forward. Personalized medicine is going to become a reality for everyone. And whole genome sequencing is going to be in the clinical setting soon. And I cannot wait for that day. So thank you so much for having me. Would you take a few questions? Absolutely. Um, a remarkable story. Now, what she didn't tell you is one of our first follow-up visits um, uh, when Alexis was using a trampoline, she came back in with a broken arm. So that was a doctor-induced broken arm. Yes. Uh, questions. Very nice talk. Very oh. emotional. And uh, 
I would like to ask you, four years after uh, the rec glad recovery of your kids, how close do you think are the doctors nowadays to predict Segawa's dystonia in, in newborns to avoid all the pain and... So the question was how close are we to predicting Segawa's dystonia in newborn um, patients. So I've just been introduced in the last week to a gentleman that's working with newborn screenings and uh, honestly I know um, very little about newborn screenings but we're going to start approaching that and see if we can get a newborn screening test done for this particular uh, illness disorder. So with uh, hindsight, you, uh, Maynard, wait one second. The physicians that saw your children <laughs> earlier uh, you know, feel as though they should have suggested this diagnosis? I'm sorry, could you repeat yeah. that one? So, uh, your, 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 your children saw innumerable physicians yes. over a long period, and in hindsight, have any of them said uh, that they should have considered this diagnosis? So, uh, their neurologist at Barrows Neurologic Center in Phoenix, I had gone and shared information with him after the first step in 2002. I gave him all the video. I gave him a letter saying I don't blame him. Um, I asked him to share it in the medical community because that's who's doing the diagnosis. And um, I have a lot of respect for him, so I, uh, I, but he told me, he said, you know, I don't, I don't know if you realize how rare this disorder is. And he didn't know of another case in Phoenix, wasn't sure if there was one in Arizona. And I said, could it be that there are a lot of other misdiagnosed cases? And, um, and he never shared the information. So I, it's a, I'm thrilled that we're right where we're at, being able to share this with people that can make a difference, that people that can um, use the information for diagnosis. But no, I don't, um, I don't know about the other physicians. Yes. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your, your personal story. I think it's just wonderful. And I wish our students were all here to hear this, that you know, this is so much impact that can be done. But one question that we often face, specifically when we deal with humans and disease, is the potential for this information to be made uh, public. Did you and your family have a discussion, you must have, about, you know, you made your story extremely public, you know, you have, you know it's a wonderful story, but, I mean, how did you guys deal with that, and were you worried ever about finding things out that you may not have wanted to know? Uh, absolutely. I, uh, I remember the conference call when Richard and Matthew called me and told me that they were going to publish the paper and they were going to put twin A and twin B. And I told them, don't do that because then it's just going to be another paper and another piece of data point. Um, and so I asked them to please use their names because it brings it to life. And then once you bring it to life, then you actually see the patient and then it, it's more meaningful and it, it's... Um, the potential is greater to advance it. Uh, I was asked this, the question, um, I was actually at the um, President's Commission for the Study of Bioethics. I testified there uh, in February, and Lonnie uh, Ali asked me if I was worried about being so public and sharing um, the information. Was I worried that they would have a problem getting insurance in the future? And, you know, I had a visual with my hands, which I, my hands are full right now, but in this hand I have the concern about insurance, I have the concern about future uh, needs for insurance, and in this hand I have their life. And there's no balance to that question. Uh, these are lives that we're talking about. And so, yes, I talked to our family about it, and, and the kids uh, see kids with disabilities all the time, and they always wonder, could they have what we have? Could they get out of their wheelchairs. Um, and so they were definitely up for making it public. Any, Any further questions? I hope we can ask that from all of the other cases we hear about in the course of this meeting. I think somewhere out there there should be a big table that says why it was, this was a surprise finding in this case and why with hindsight we would have known in the first place. If I'm right, Retta, the children would have had to come off the dopamine supplements to have the spinal tap to do the definitive biochemical diagnosis that might have revealed what it really was, and you weren't going to do that. 
That's and the single locus test wasn't available either. So those are kind of two compounding factors. That, and the third thing I think was, and this is part of the review of the publication, there is no way these children could have been diagnosed with cerebral palsy. That was in the review. But they were in fact diagnosed with cerebral palsy. So I think the point may note is that the boundary between reality and what those of us in the peanut gallery think should be happening um, is what's driving this hindsight. How it's going to tell you about a story and people are going to say, well, you should have done a bone marrow in the first transplant in the first place. So I think we should ask this question throughout this whole conference. Thanks, Beretta. Thanks, Richard. Well, thank you so much. Let's have a hand, Beretta, for this <laughs> tremendous story. And, and actually, uh, Unfortunately, it had to be twin A and twin B. The reviewers would not let us put the uh, names of the children there, even with parental permission. So uh, let's go on to our next talk. How it